Perfect. So good afternoon to, to everyone and welcome to this welcome session of Euravia Mission, the first European Student Space Hackathon. It's Mar Fernandez, part of the communication team at Kim Knowledge Innovation Market. And today we will have the presentation of the boosting entities, Euroavia and Kim, and its main partner, European Space Agency. So um, we will talk about the planning of the week, and then we will have a question, question and answer round. So you can write your questions at the specific box in, at Zoom. And then we will finish with a lecture of Litia Verde. So first of all, we have the Euroavia welcome with Vanete Shimeno. He's the current vice president of the International Board. Vanet, when you want. Uh, yes, uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Uh, well, for us, uh, it's uh, as Euroavia, it's a pleasure to be uh, here presenting this uh, this event, uh, uh, the European St Student Space Hackathon, the European Mission, uh, that we are organizing uh, together with uh, Kim, uh, which, uh, well, it has been also a pleasure to work with them uh, along this year preparing the event and in collaboration with the European Space Agency. As I was saying, uh, for us, it's a really important event because it's a great approach, we think, for all the students in Europe uh, to the uh, space industry. And uh, with it, uh, we hope that all of you can get closer to uh, all companies and uh, learn how uh, to solve current issues that are uh, today in the space industry. Also, well, I would like to welcome uh, the president of the current international board, uh, Victoria Prieto, who is here uh, in the webinar and is going also to present a little bit more about the association uh, Euravia. So now I can speak. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Thank you very much. So I'm uh, sorry, I cannot put my camera. I don't know why. But uh, well, just I uh, wanted to say that um, we are really happy of, I mean, we are really excited about this opportunity for Eurasia. And I'm here representing that it, what is uh, the International Board. I'm Victoria, by the way. Uh, the president, but we also have uh, not only the secretary and the treasurer, but also many working groups who have been working a lot uh, in everything regarding the hackathon and other activities we organize. And so we really want to continue with this project and with other projects that might come in the future. And just as a brief into the introduction, Eurav for those who don't know Euravia, we are basically the European Association of Aerospace Students. So what we aim to do is to spread the aerospace sector uh, among uh, not only students, but also companies and creating a network between these uh, our members, external members, and these companies uh, that I'm speaking about. So this is specifically a great opportunity for all of us, I think. Uh, we really look forward to continuing with the uh, this collaboration for the future. And for the rest, uh, welcome to everybody. And I hope you will really enjoy this, uh, this uh, opportunity. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Perfect, thank you, Benet, and thank you, Victoria. Um, then uh, let me introduce Carlos Alvarez. He's the marketing manager at Kim. Carlos? Yeah, thank you, Ma. Going to share a presentation. Hold on a second. So then I'll stop sharing. Yeah, please. Okay, now you see my presentation, I guess. Right? You see my presentation? Okay. Well, this is this is me. I'm Carlos Alvarez. As Ma already said, I'm the marketing director at uh, at Kim. In, in, well, I'm, I'm in Vigo, mm, but the headquarters of Kim in, is in is in Barcelona, in Catalonia. As as you can see, I'm a I'm a business major. No, special is particularly marketing, my my focus. But I've been working with uh, on innovation for the last twenty years, mm, uh, mostly with uh, startups. Mm, 
I'm, I'm currently the I'm a shareholder with uh, six of them, mostly in the medtech uh, industry. And I'm gonna tell you just a, a, free, a, a few words about uh, King. Well, uh, this is King, uh, our beliefs. No? We, we believe that uh, organizations uh, can use uh, both uh, uh, internal ideas, as was the, usually the case until five, 10 years ago, but also internal ideas. Yeah? That's our belief that we, we believe in open innovation. Mm -hmm because that's the way to, to advance, to go faster and to, to spread more innovation in the market. Uh, our ecosystem, our uh, innovation ecosystem is all of these, are all these, all these players. We work with all of them. We work with uh, either open innovation organizations, usually large uh, uh, international companies, but also with uh, innovation suppliers like you could be sometime in the future, either a startup or, or research and technology organization, or maybe you work, uh, you will work in a, in a lab for a large uh, company. And also uh, with what we call the uh, facilitators, which are, uh, there are many kinds of facilitators in this ecosystem, government agencies, industry organizations, investors. You know? So basically our, our mission uh, is to, to facilitate the relationships uh, among these all these actors and, and to align their, their needs and, and expectations mm, so we can uh, fulfill our promise uh, of innovation, which is that we focus on the transfer of technologies within this whole uh, innovation ecosystem. Uh, our job on a day-to-day -day basis is basically marketing yeah, and with a very specific focus on what we call now deep tech, which I guess is what most of you are, are doing. Mm -hmm. And we provide a, a whole range of marketing services from market research, from business modeling, from IP strategy, commercialization, marketing communications, and, and so on. Uh, well, as, as I said at the beginning, uh, me personally, I'm in Vigo, but our headquarters is in Barcelona. We have also an office uh, in Madrid, and we have also a, an office in, in Santiago de Chile, in, in Chile. So we are pretty knowledgeable both about the, the European ecosystem and the, and the Latin American ecosystem. Um, well, uh, we have been working in this open innovation field for the last uh, 10, 12 years, but probably the, the, the the clients that probably resonate the, the most with you are Eurofusion, which is the devoted to nuclear fusion, and the European Space Agency. And well, within this framework of the European Space Agency, we have done plenty of things. We have been technology brokers, but we have also organized a lot of lots of uh, promotion events to to, well, to promote the, the business of space. Uh, well, uh, that's that's it for about uh, Kim. If you have further questions about our, our our business or you want to contact us, here you have my my contact details. And thank you. And I think it's your turn again, Bennett. Bennett. Perfect. So, thank you, Carlos. Um, now we are glad to have Susana Soto with us. She is the business innovation innovation engineer at ISO. Uh, Susana, please. Hello all. I'm going to try to share my screen as well. Do you see the full screen mode or do you see? Can you hear me? Yeah. Full screen, you... Susanna. Perfect, thank you, thanks a lot. Um, so as Mal was saying, I'm uh, Susana Soto. I'm the business um, business innovation engineer at the uh, at ISA. In particular, I work as part of the uh, ISA Space Solutions uh, team. 
And uh, it's an honor to be here today with you all and be part of this hackathon, have the chance to meet some of you during, uh, during this week, and also to be able to let you know a little bit more about how we support from uh, ESA, um, the development of space technologies, but also um, businesses. So just yes, very quickly, for um, those of you that might not be familiar with this, uh, uh, so the European Space Agency has the mission to shape the development of Europe's space capability. Uh, exclusively for peaceful purposes. Uh, so it focuses mainly in promoting cooperation among um, member states in the development of space technology, but also space applications. Uh, so you see on the uh, map, uh, it counts now with uh, 22 member states and it has uh, eight sites across Europe and also spaceport in uh, French Guiana. And it has supported the uh, design, testing, and operations of um, over 80 satellites. But that's not the only thing that uh, we do. Uh, so as you see uh, on the screen, you can see the different areas in which we are involved. Uh, so ESA is indeed one of the few space agencies in the world that combines responsibility in almost all areas of space activity. And um, as you see on the screen, ESA Space Solutions falls uh, in the middle because we support the startups and SMEs uh, that are developing technologies in all the different fields. Uh, so what we do is that we support the journey of a company or a product from uh, inception to commercialization. So these companies might be either developing technology that is going to space, or they might be using technology from space um, that is going to be applied to other non-space markets. And just to give you an overview of the Space Solutions Network itself, so it's the uh, largest innovation network in the world uh, related to space. And this is not only thanks to ESA, but it's mainly uh, because we rely on local partners on, uh, on the different member states. And these uh, local partners are the hosted, uh, hosting organizations for the business incubation centers, also the technology transfer brokers as uh, as uh, Kim, for example, who, as, as it was mentioned by Carlos, it's a long-term uh, partner from us, and also in uh, with the business applications ambassadors. So our program then is, is really uh, designed to provide multiple entry points, um, and in this way, supporting businesses at different uh, stages of, uh, of development. So if we start with the business equation centers, all the ISABICs across the member states, they follow uh, the same uh, common approach. And at the moment, we count with 22 centers spread over 70 locations. And uh, we support around 200 startups uh, per year. And um, the main purpose of the uh, ISABICs is really to support uh, early stage startups uh, through the first phases of prototyping and commercialization. In terms of the technology brokers, um, they aim at supporting existing businesses by solving their innovation challenges uh, using space technology. So this is really about transferring space technology into non-space markets and vice versa as well. And, um, and finally, we have also the uh, business applications ambassadors. So these play a similar role uh, within the ecosystem than the uh, technology brokers with the main difference that they are really there to um, uh, show companies the benefits of the use of satellite data in non-space markets. So they hold workshops, events, uh, similar to the brokers as well. Uh, but in this case, about the opportunities that data and satellite data can bring to, to other uh, industries. And they also support these companies in uh, applying for funding in business applications. And business applications is mainly the name of the funding program uh, for project-based activities. And uh, as mentioned, this is only uh, supporting uh, companies who look at integrating satellite data within their services. But the, our innovation network is not just that. So we also rely on other supporting mechanisms from ESA, uh, but also from external partners. So in terms of ESA, we also have the uh, technology transfer and patent office. And um, they, so ESA in general, they develop a vast array of technology. And this sometimes results in uh, intellectual property that has a lot of uh, commercial potential. 
and in particular for non-space markets. Uh, so the um, patent office counts with a patent portfolio of hundreds of patents that are available there also for, uh, for industry. And then we also have the Space Solutions Alliance, which is looking um, towards creating collaborations between companies that are supported through these space solutions and other industry players. But it's about really uh, bringing um, purpose-driven collaborations, kind of win-win uh, situations. And then we also have a um, long list of partners that I don't have to, time to go through, but just for you to know that we have uh, uh, also partners in universities, research centers, uh, European investment uh, networks, innovation networks, and so on. And just, I just wanted to go very quickly through the um, offering of the ESA Business Incubation Centers in case some of you uh, might be at the stage of uh, starting uh, a company or might consider it in the future. Uh, so the support package is mainly, um, we support companies with uh, technical support, which is uh, offered by the uh, local partners and is tailored really to the company needs. But this comes accompanied as well by business and commercial support and mentoring. Uh, the companies can have access to office space, share facilities, and they also have 50,000 uh, euros in non-equity funding, which is mainly for procurement activities of their product development. And the companies can also have access to the uh, Space Solutions Alliance that I was mentioning before, obviously the network of, of startups and alumni. And um, it can also be a door opener to international investors and they can make use of the uh, ESA big brand. And in terms of more established businesses uh, that are uh, developing um, solutions on uh, downstream applications, um, business applications um, uh, has a particular interest really on projects that are applying space technology to consumer markets, but uh, in particular to those consumer markets that are not making use of space technology as yet. Um, so for these programs, uh, the space um, and the company should be making use of one of more of the space assets uh, that you can see on the right, uh, left hand side. And the offer for business applications is similar, but is more uh, project based, as I was mentioning. So it's really a, a project tailored to, to the company and to the product they want to, de to develop or the service. They also have uh, zero equity funding. In this case, the projects go from 50,000 euros to 2 million. They also have technical and, and commercial support and access to, uh, to the same networks. And I just wanted to finish with this slide because it's just a very nice example of the uh, map of companies that have uh, gotten support from ESA Space Solutions during 2020, either through the ESA Bigs or through business applications. Um, so this is mainly just because it shows the, the different, all the different fields that are covered by, um, um, by the companies that we support in the upstream, uh, in technologies, but mainly also in the downstream. Uh, so this is really showing the past reach of uh, space assets in different sectors. And um, basically the main message is that the space is, is everywhere. And that's all from me. Thank you. Perfect, Susana. Thank you for your words. And uh, we conclude this block of presentations and proceed to explain how the two days of hackathon will work on this uh, this week entirely. So, Benet, if you want to share your screen. Yes, I'm on it. So, as Mar was uh, mentioning, I'm going to present you how uh, the event is going to to work as. All you may know, the competition is going to be held uh, this Friday and Saturday in a 24 hours event. And uh, also, well, uh, as you know, uh, hackathons are about uh, solving challenges. So uh, first of all, I would like to present you the challenges that you will have to face in order to, to compete in this, in this hackathon. All these challenges uh, have been proposed by space companies. So they are problems that the current industry is facing right now. So I think that it's really a really interesting opportunity to learn and develop uh, new ideas uh, for these uh, challenges. The first one is about deep learning for Earth observation presented by EarthPulse. Then uh, we have one about map matching uh, for urban location 
that is presented by Rokubun. Uh, also, we have one presented by the European Union Agency for, for the Space Program uh, that is uh, uh, about develop, developing a smartphone application uh, with features of a EGNSS and Copernicus. And also one presented by Stelliot that is about uh, well designing uh, well, a mission design software. But this hackathon is not only about uh, solving these problems, but also about engaging all together in uh, several activities. After more than a year and a half of pandemic, it's, uh, as I was saying, not only about the engineering side of it, but also the part of getting all together and being able to meet people from all around Europe that have the same interest and passion for space that, that we have. So here you have the schedule uh, of the first two days of the, of the event, which are today. We are right now in the welcome and explaining how this event is going to work. And then we're going to have uh, this uh, conference uh, by Licia Verde. And finally, for all the, all the participants that want uh, to, to take part in it, we're going to share a cultural dinner, which basically, as you may have read in the uh, emails information, is just learning how to cook a dish from another part of Europe and then, well, do some uh, team building together uh, while, while we prepare it and, and we eat it. It's online, but still it's a social activity that we can uh, do to interact a bit more uh, between the participants of the hackathon. Then on Wednesday, uh, we can say that we start uh, touching the challenges and learning about them. We have the presentation of the four uh, challenges by uh, experts uh, from each company. Uh, there, you are going to learn how you, ha how you can tackle the challenge and uh, how is it going to be uh, focused. And finally, we are going to, uh, well, to reach the competition day, as I was saying, Friday and Saturday. So during this competition, you will also have the chance to get in touch with professional mentors that are going to guide you uh, to develop your solution. Uh, there are going to be technical experts and also business experts. And at the end of it, uh, the jury is going to analyze the, all your proposals to decide the winners of the prizes. As I was saying, uh, we have uh, well mentors in both business and, and, and technical side, and all of them are experts in the space uh, sector, even if it's from the business side, as Carlos Alvarede, Mireia Colina, or Susana Soto, that you have just met, uh, and technical uh, mentors, which are David Triado, Alberto Garcia Rigo, Paul Guiche, Jordi Gutierrez, and Javier Marín. You can uh, check all this information about the mentors and all the experts of the hackathon on our website. Also, uh, in the website, you can meet the jury that is going to evaluate uh, your proposals and your ideas. All of them have a vast experience uh, in both the technical and, and business side of space. Also, well, as I was saying, the final goal uh, for most of you in the hackathon, apart from learning, is trying to aim for the prizes that we have. Uh, there are three categories uh, in this event. The first one is the absolute categories in which all of you uh, take part. So the winner is going to receive 1,000 euros that is given by the government of Catalonia, the Institute of Space Studies of Catalonia and the EDOSCAD Foundation, a bridge learning module in space economy by Space School, three consulting hours by Buffet and Magical Bed, and Fast Track Business Model Lab uh, given by Start uh, UB. Then the best uh, team that belongs to Euroavia is going to receive also 1,000 euros by the government of Catalonia Institute of Institute of Space Studies of Catalonia and Idoscat Foundation, and three consulting hours given by Buffet de Mas y Calvet. And finally, the best project uh, of uh, taking part in the Rukubun Challenge is going to have three months uh, of access to JSON, that is their platform that you're going to use to develop uh, their, their challenge. Well, all of that obviously wouldn't be possible uh, with uh, all of our sponsors. And well, you can get more information about all of them on our website. If you go to a website, you can uh, click to their logo and you're going to be di directed to their website and learn more about them. And well, finally, if you are here just to know more about the hackathon, but you still have not registered, uh, join us uh, by scanning this QR code. You are going to visit our website and there you can register for the webinar session of Wednesday and also for the event. And now I think it's time for questions, uh, Matt. Yeah, perfect, Benet. Um, 
Yes, now it's time to solve the questions, but there's no questions at the box. I don't know if in the chat participants have any question. Sorry. If you have questions, please. Oh, no. I see one of you. Malek Burguera. Uh, yeah, hi. You can hear me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, I had a question about um, yeah, using uh, satellites for. Um, yeah, either the earth observation or for navigation i saw on one slide that like it had been uses and i was wondering like um yeah is it better in general um to use satellite uh images for yeah this kind of problems or drone because nowadays drones are also getting more popular and yeah like if what's the difference maybe yeah thanks So shall I take the lead on this one? <laughs> yeah, so they, it, thank you, Vinit. So I think, um, so it depends on the, um, on the uh, on the purpose that uh, that you're trying to to achieve with uh, with satellite images or uh, with drone images so they have different kind of uh, characteristics and uh, you will have different kind of um, uh, for example resolution for the images so it depends really on the uh, on the um, uh, on the par specific parameters that you need, that you would uh, maybe use satellite images or either uh, drone images or might be able to combine both in the same solution. Mm, okay, great. Thank you. Bennett, we have uh, another question. Um, I am not in a team. How can I join a team? Also, will this recording uh, be shared? A person who asked yeah for, uh, for the for the team um you can uh register as i was saying by scanning this qr or in, i'm going to tap in, tap in the chat the uh i'm going to tap in the chat the the website uh and there uh, you can register and you have three different options uh, you can register with a closed team uh, or just that you are saying that you are a team that is looking for more participants or you can register alone and we are going to create the teams considering the different backgrounds of all of you and uh, so that you can have the most interdisciplinary team uh, to take part in the hackathon. I don't know if that solves the question. And about the recording, uh, Mar? Yes, um, I think uh, probably on the website we could share it there. Okay, I don't know if there's another, another question. Just for curiosity, how many of you have already joined the event and how many of you are that, uh, doubting if uh, you'll join it? Bennett, we have another question. Um, Malik says, I was wondering for the, the, the liberals expected, 
we are supposed to give a solution proposition or a full solution fully developed? Um, well, obviously it's 24 hours uh, event and it's what you can develop in this uh, 24 hours, but you have to think both about the technical and the business side. So not only about uh, the technical, the, how you will develop it, but also how are you going to make business of, of it? How you are going to, to sell it? Uh, and basically what you're going to present to the jury, it's uh, a presentation of uh, between five, seven minutes, something like that, explaining your technical ideas and also selling your project to them. It's more like a meeting with some stakeholders. That's the final goal of your work. Then also they may have questions, so you need to prepare everything to ensure that everything makes sense and it's a proper proposal. Another question. Um, I have joined the Discord server, but I don't see other members. It's a problem with my login or is it something else? At the moment, uh, people that join Discord server still don't have a role because uh, still the people that join without a team don't have a team yet, as we are waiting uh, for all the registers to, make, to, be, to uh, be able to create the most interdisciplinary teams as possible. So once uh, all, everybody is in the Discord server, we're going to sign you the roles. And in that point, I guess that it's when you're going to have the permissions. By roles, I mean um, we're going to sign that you belong to team one, two, three, or four, so you can enter the channels of each team and, and you have all the necessary permissions to do so. Okay. No more questions? Well, if you want, um... We got ahead of time, so if uh, you want to do a break at the session until seven for the Litia Verdes uh, section. Bennett, it could be a good idea. Uh, yes, of course, we can do this. Uh, just break of 20 minutes or something like that, 20, 25 minutes. Perfect. And, and see you uh, at seven. Okay. So, see you at seven. Oh. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Litia, good afternoon. <laughs> this is a, a kind of surprise. <laughs> so if you are ready to, to start. Me, I'm ready to start? Yes. Because in the program, I had it at uh, 7, isn't, I, isn't it? So I was in another meeting until now, <laughs> actually. We know, we know. Okay, our, so our presentations are too short. Oh, okay. So yeah, let me get out my uh, my presentation and make sure I can uh, share the screen and all that. Huh? Okay, I can introduce you. Um, well, we have the pleasure to announce Litia Verde. Uh, she has been an ICREA professor since two thousand and seven and belongs to the research group in cosmology and large scale structures and at the Institute of uh, Cosmos Science, specifically doing observational cosmology and among different awards and distinctions with uh, which it has been awarded, we highlight the prize for basic research that it has received in 2021. So congrats, Litia. Thank you. So let me see how I can share the screen and how that works. Let's try. Uh, okay. 
Perfect. Okay, what do you see? Do you Your see screen. <laughs> my, but you see my screen or my presentation? Your presentation. Okay, because that's not obvious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay, you. so thank you, thank you for uh, inviting me to he to be here. Thank you for thank you to uh, everybody that is uh, uh, connected. Uh, and um, so uh, I, I know the title may seem strange, but uh, let's see if I can sort of inspire you to think about you know going into space also in terms of uh, connection with things as you know the origin of the universe and and fundamental physics uh, so uh, we 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 are born to explore this is uh, uh, the picture of actually my my two daughters when they were uh, they were baby and you can tell that each one has in their own character different ways to explore there are people who actually want to go there and explore it that way and there are people who actually simply explore by making experiments and somehow in a more uh, remote uh, and indirect uh, way so they explore by you know learning physics or things like that and we have done that as the human species also in the same sense right with uh, uh, Columbus uh, the exploration was going somewhere and discovering new worlds and we've done space exploration by sending uh, people and probes into space but there is also a way to do exploration remotely which is building uh, big telescopes and actually observing as far as you can observe as far as the technology allows you and then there is this sort of intermediate way we use it actually to send the telescope into space to be able to peer even farther into space. And this is uh, a NASA launch of actually a, a, a space mission for, uh, for science. So uh, what I do is, uh, is cosmology and uh, cosmology, it's uh, a word that uh, has a root from ancient Greek. Cosmos means uh, uh, universe and order, but also beauty and logi is the study. And in cosmology, we address big questions, which are things like what makes up the universe? How did the universe begin? How did it end up looking the way it does? And if you answer all these questions, then the next natural one is, well, how would it end? And uh, um, the fundamental assumption from the fact that, that we can ask this question and use the scientific method to answer this question, it's that we believe that the universe is comprehensible and that physics and therefore chemistry and therefore mathematics, as we know them and test them here on earth, describe and explain everything, not just here on earth, but also in the entire universe. Now, explain means here in this sentence how and not necessarily why but it's still explain and so what i find particularly fascinating of all this not just that we believe that the universe is comprehensible and is comprehensible to us i mean if i take i don't know a dog or a cat i wouldn't expect that animal to be able to understand the universe yet as a human species we have this uh, you know thought that we can understand the whole universe so that's for the philosophers though and it's also that uh, uh, there are uh, deep connections so uh, we believe that there is a fundamental physical theory that connects the infinitely big and the infinitely small and that one not comprehend one without the other one. So I like this uh, Ouroboros uh, image, which shows that the universe at the smallest scales at the fabric of space, time and fundamental particle, it's connected to the universe at its largest scales all the way to big group of galaxies and all the way to you know what we call the horizon as far as we can see. So, in general, the cosmology is special, not just because of everything I said, but also because we can't make experiments, we can only make observations. Um, and so as a result, we have to use the entire observable universe as a detector. 
but the tactor is given and we can't tinker with it. And so this has pushed us to observe as much as possible of the universe, because of course, if you have a big detector, you know, you have better sensitivity and you can do, you can get better results. So the other interesting thing is that light, as we know, and as uh, Einstein told us, travel as a final speed. So for example, when we see the light coming from the sun, I'll now never look directly at the sun. So here in this picture, we are looking at the sun only uh, uh, at, uh, at uh, at uh, dusk, uh, at dusk, so it's it's <laughs> safer. Uh, we see it as it come uh, from eight minutes ago, but then when we see something that comes, say, from the center of the galaxies, it would be uh, twenty-eight thousand years ago. And then when we see a nearby galaxies, we see it as it was millions of years ago. And when we look at the at far away galaxy, it could be light from. 3 billion years ago or even more. So looking far away, it's equal to looking back in time simply because light takes time to travel and the distances are big. And so the next question is, well, how far can you look? That's nice because you can do cosmic archaeology. Is instead of digging and finding bones, you see the past as it was alive and kicking. So the next logical question is how far back can you look? And, and can you look at the beginning if there was at the beginning? And now we all know even prime time television tell us that it all started with a big bang, although this was not always obvious. And actually we should remember that the name big bang was coined by Fred Hoyle in a BBC radio interview in 1949, where he said that he couldn't believe uh, this in instantaneous creation of the universe. It has some sort of religious connotation, but he liked to say it's like you know going to a party and having the cake of the party open up and a person <laughs> coming out of, of that. And he had his own theory that rely on a steady state universe. But at the same time, Another group of physicists led by George Gamow uh, was actually working out uh, based on, uh, on basic uh, chemistry and atomic physics, how the elements that make up the universe could have been formed. And their intuition was that, well, uh, there should have been a hot and dense phase at the beginning of the universe. And we knew from the observation of Hubble in the 1920s, that uh, on average galaxy seems to sort of fly away from each other. So if you see it as a movie and then move, run the movie backwards in, 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 in reverse, then at some point everything was you know, all concentrated. And when you compress things, they tend to become hot. If you ever try to pump a, a bicycle a tire, when you try to compress the air in it, it becomes hot. So, uh, then you needed a hot Big Bang. And so these two ways of looking at the structure of the universe and what makes up the universe and the physics underlying the universe were finally disentangled uh, with the observation by Pensions and Wilson in 1965 that space is filled with a leftover heat from this Big Bang. This is a leftover radiation, which is called the, the cosmic microwave background or the CMB for the aficionados. And in this map here, I'm not saying that the universe is an egg shape. I'm saying that this is just a projection. So it's a way to project the sphere uh, on <laughs> a, a slide. This was a, a 1978 uh, uh, Nobel Prize. And what you see here is the emission for our galaxy. This uh, emission, uh, it's uh, uniform across the sky. It corresponds to a temperature of about uh, three Kelvin. That's, uh, pretty, that's pretty cold. And it's in the uh, millimeter wavelengths, radio wavelengths. So, how it goes is that the universe is expanding. We are here in time, back in time. And therefore, if we look far away and back in time, there, there was this epoch when the universe was hot. 
and uh, and and dance. Uh, okay, so this was a uniform uh, distribution, and then the next the question that came naturally to mind is: Okay, fine, we've seen this, but that's uniform, and today we are here. There are planets, there are stars, there are galaxies. There is structure. Where are the seeds of that? Because without that, we can't form star planets and and people. And this was a big mystery for many years. And why this was a big mystery and why this require space? And we'll see it immediately. It's because there is the atmosphere. And there is water in the atmosphere. And by having an atmosphere from us living on, on, the, on Earth, there is assertion of uh, radiation that come from out there at the wavelengths of particular interest. So uh, there are uh, windows that uh, allows to observe, but there is a still contribution of uh, uh, absorption uh, from, uh, from uh, the, 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 the atmosphere. So there is a tiny window here. There is a window here. This is better, but uh, there's uh, no more uh, cosmic radiation left. So all the name of the game is being played here. And the other thing is that we are talking about heat. We are trying to look for small fluctuation of a signal, which is at a temperature of three Kelvin. Three Kelvin is minus 270 degrees Celsius. So if you try to take a picture of uh, a, a landscape on an infrared camera that shows you when things are hot, you would see that whether it's day or night, winter or summer, if you have stuff around you, it will definitely be a much more than minus 270 Celsius. So try to measure small fluctuation around three Kelvin from here with all the atmosphere absorption, et cetera, it's a challenge. And therefore, uh, the experiment ended up being, uh, having to be done in space because of the opacity and noise of the atmosphere, because of thermal stability, also because of full sky coverage, because unless one is sitting exactly on the uh, equator, uh, one can't see the whole sky. And even from the equator, part of the sky are on the horizon, which are hard to see anyway. And then 100% of service efficiency, which from the ground one never has. So, this was the result of the first image that we saw of the seeds of galaxy and stars and planets and people, etc. that was discovered by a NASA satellite, uh, COBE, uh, in 1992, not published until uh, 1994. And these blobs that we see here, this is the emission from our own galaxy, which emits in the same wavelengths, but these here, are small anisotropy, about one part in 100,000. So they are tiny. Uh, but these are the seeds of galaxies. And so once this was observed, then a sort of a new window opened up because now with this image of uh, what became known as the image of the baby universe, one can start asking and have a hope to answer the question, what makes up the universe? How did it begin? How did it end up looking the way it does? And maybe even how would it end? So I want to tell you the story of uh, uh, this mission, uh, not because it's the latest and the best one, but because I was involved with it. And this is an image of the WMAP launch from Cape Canaveral that was in, in, uh, in 2001. Here it is. And so the satellite was in here. This um, uh, ended up in the second Lagrangian point, which is uh, uh, at uh, a million kilometers from Earth, but is much more stable than just the Bain in orbit. It was the only thing then, but since then other mission have been there to keep it company, although by now this mission is finished and dead, and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, not uh, at L2 uh, stable anymore. So the purpose of this uh, uh, mission was to uh, take a high resolution map of this cosmic microwave background radiation to determine the cosmology of our universe. And I like to 
um, uh, visualize this by taking an actual picture of a baby. So if the universe today were to be a mature person, then taking the picture of the universe when we see this radiation will be equivalent to take the picture of the baby when the baby was, you know, a few uh, minutes, not, not even an hour old. So this is actually a picture of a baby. And so the previous image that we got from Kobe was a low resolution picture. You can sort of tell that there is a baby there, but you can't tell too much. But as you increase the resolution, then you can really see that it's a baby. And then if you zoom in, you can even tell when the baby was born, if you could actually you know, read the, the, the bracelet there, which is uh, what one of the things that this mission managed to uh, provide, which is an estimate of the age of the universe. So here it is. You have your mission. You look up to all the universe until you see the earliest light that you can see. And this is a bit of a visualization of what I was saying before. We can see the earliest light, which is the baby universe, throughout the snapshots of the entire evolution of the universe, which is a little bit like looking at uh, a family album of photos when you see the person at different stages of their life in several different pictures. And this is the nice thing of doing cosmic archaeology by just peering far away into space. And so you can learn a lot about the person if you have many pictures of the person in the, at different stages of their life, rather than if you only have you know, a single snapshot. So let's recap. What we have seen are hot and cold spots, which correspond to tiny ripple in density. And these were the seeds of galaxies. And the detailed statistical properties of these ripples tell us a lot about the universe. And these are the ripple that grew under gravity and gave us the structure that we see today. So here I have an, ima an animation that try to say that these ripple are a little bit like a fingerprint. And then as you do with the fingerprint to figure out what the suspect is and the characteristic of the suspect, this is exactly what the analysis of this data works out. And from this analysis, one can determine quantity like when were the first star formed, what's the content of atoms in the universe, what is the content of dark matter, the shape, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, one of the first results is, well, there is a, lot, a heck of a lot of dark matter out there. We knew this basically from the COBE result. We didn't need to wait for the WMAP result. There is, uh, we now know with much more precision that there is about five times as much dark matter as a normal matter. By normal matter, I mean anything that you can touch and handle, not necessarily everything that shine out there in the universe. So if you say, you know, my table or the earth uh, doesn't shine, but it's still normal matter, it's not dark matter. But this opens another big question, which is related to the, this Ouroboros that I was showing at the beginning and the connection between the infinitely big and the infinitely small, where is the dark matter in the model of the fundamental particles? If we believe we have a wonderful, which we do, a wonderful model of the fundamental particle and in, in interaction of physics, where is the dark matter from there? So after COBE and WMAP, there were a lot of other experiments, some of them ground-based, a small patch of the sky, specific range of frequencies, and then another big space mission, uh, the, the, the Planck Surveyor, uh, in, uh, which uh, produced the first map in uh, 2013. And what we are seeing here could be described as a cosmic symphony. So let's say, uh, it's a little bit like uh, when to figure out how something of what material makes up something, you knock on it and you say, oh, I'm knocking on wood or I'm knocking on plastic or I'm knocking on, on metals. And this is a little bit the game that one is playing there. These are uh, the universe back then was hot and dense. Uh, there were... Uh, there were uh, 
uh, ripples. They were ripples in a gas. Ripples in a gas are nothing like but sound. So this is seen sound waves, but this is not a single waves. This is like a symphony. So we are seeing a cosmic symphony. Mm, in another way of saying is when Fermi was trying to sell the first particle accelerators was saying, well, you know, in a particle accelerators, we take two grand piano, we smash them together and we try to figure out how the instrument is made while well, the two grand piano were actually particles. While what here one is doing is trying to listen to the music that comes from the instrument and figure out how the instrument is made. And then you may ask me the question, well, who plays the instrument? And this is deeply related to the question, how did the universe begin? Because it's, it's exactly the same question. So the kind of question that one can ask and try to address with this kind of data, which one can gather because one can rise above the atmosphere and get the necessary stability and the necessary uh, access to the, to the necessary uh, electromagnetic band is question about existence and nature of dark matter. But then also we know that there is dark energy out there, that the expansion of the universe is actually accelerated. And I'm sure this is no news for, 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 for anybody. And then that's another issue that is dark energy is what energy from nothing. So this goes back to, do we understand the fabric of space-time if we see there is <laughs> energy just from space that is nothing? And the question of the origin of the universe and what power the Big Bang. And so again, this... Uh, there are many more missions that uh, are, uh, are being planned and uh, are ready to, to be launched that are trying to address this question, not just by observing the baby universe, but also by observing anything in between the baby universe and today, which is what I call uh, the larger scale structure, that is the clustering of objects such as uh, galaxies or other kind of medium or even uh, small perturbation that the light suffer because of the dark matter that is along the way. So, uh, since I want to leave some time for questions and, and, and maybe discussion, let me finish here. Let me go back to my late motive that there is a deep connection between the very, very big and the, and the very, very small. And so we are nicely here in the middle and uh, space and all the technology that allows to make this uh, observation for the experiment in space. Uh, open a window that uh, for uh, that we would not have had from the ground because of the atmosphere and because of the full sky and because of the stability of the of the instrument. And uh, I know that I open more questions that that I gave answer, but that's the cool things of uh, doing this kind of job. Thank you. Paulitia, so thank you very much for, for a such interesting and funny presentation. Um, raise your hands to ask Litia if you want to solve one loop. Or if you have- I don't know if there are questions in the Q&A or- Not yet. Okay. All clear. <laughs> I think everybody's completely confused. <laughs> no. It was it was a really so. nice presentation. Thank you very much, Alicia. Yeah, that's okay. Ah. Shall I read ah, the one question? question? Yes. Yeah. So the question is. Uh, Javier, uh, yeah. is that do I pronounce correctly? What are the hot topics right now in cosmology? Excellent question. So it depends if you are a theorist or if you are an observer or if you are somewhere in the in the middle. The, the, the big question are usual are nature of dark matter, 
what is this accelerated expansion that or this dark energy we 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 know it's there we have evidence that there is something there but we really don't understand it and uh, there's uh, there's uh, effort to actually try it. so so i would say the dark energy is probably the leading um scientific case for a lot of the effort uh, in uh, in cosmology and so there are a uh, huge survey going on trying to observe all there is to see basically so uh, clustering of galaxy clustering of a big structure of galaxy clustering of the intergalactic medium to try to see the effect of dark energy both in the in the history of the universe and figure out what the property of dark energy are the other big question is who plays the instrument that is what power the big bang that's uh, that's another open question so the main route to answer that question is better observation of the early universe, that is the baby universe, the cosmic microwave background, and, uh, and uh, more, more finest observation in the sense that that radiation, we know it's polarized, and the polarization of that radiation probably holds the key to answer the question, who plays the instrument? So I hope this answered your question. Maybe I can say that this has been answered live. Okay, somebody broke the ice, good. Gregorio, how can you resolve the distance from the light you receive, for example, I didn't get the passage, I take a picture of the sky, how do I connect the distance of the object? Excellent question. So what we measure very easily are not exactly distances. What we measure is the effect of the expansion of the universe on the light that we receive from the objects. So we know uh, the spectrum of objects, like we know the spectrum of the sun. The sun is a pretty normal star. So, so the sun has a specific spectral line in, in its spectrum. And in the same way, galaxies that are made of a lot of stars, not all like the sun, but you know, Let's just take it from there. Have a specific line in their spectrum, and these lines we can kind of correspond to specific elements, which we can measure here on Earth. And then we see them that are typically red shifted, and therefore this tells us what the redshift is, which tells us the recession velocity, which we can convert into an approximate distance. We don't necessarily measure distance directly. We measure easily angles. And we measure easily redshift that are recession velocity. But from that, then we can infer distances within a model, which is a standard enough model that everybody would agree. So uh, this answers your first question, I hope. Uh, although there are other ways to get other type of distances. If you know that you have a standard uh, uh, a standard candle that is a tip, an explosion of a typical star, which you know it's always the same, and you've calibrated this nearby. When you see the same explosion from the same type of star alpha way across the universe, then you know the what is called the luminosity distance, which is a way to measure distances. Second question: Is machine learning a lever a relevant tool in cosmology? Uh, so this this is a very uh, up-to-date state-of-the-art question. Machine learning in the past five years or so has made really uh, an important entrance in astronomy. In cosmology, not quite yet as much, basically because we do have a very good model for the universe. And as you know, machine learning is extremely useful where you have, either you don't have a good model and then machine learning give you an effective model for your data, or where you have so many data that uh, you wouldn't be able to analyze them. And so you go on machine learning because that's better than nothing. So while it's true, we are getting into the, the regime of big data and so many data, those data are so expensive to get that not the majority of the community is willing to actually say, let's leave it to machine learning because we wouldn't be able to do it in another way. So, but it's true that it's entering in part of this whole program between taking the observation, interpreting them and making the connection to the theory. There are parts in this whole process where we don't have a good model of what's going on and there machine learning is really entering. But there is a conference 
uh, a couple of weeks from now, which is exactly about this. What is the role of machine learning in cosmology in the years to come? And what are the pros and the cons? And so, yeah, very timely question. Uh, do I use the Doppler effect? Basically, yes. How old is the model we are using for the Cosmo? Who invented the current model we have? Okay, so this is another uh, uh, interesting and historical question. So the model we have uh, today, we, we are calling the, uh, the Lambda CDM model. What does it mean? Lambda means cosmological constant. That's the, the, the placeholder for, for dark energy. Uh, C, cold dark matter is dark matter, but we give it a little bit of more an explanation. We say it's, uh, it's, uh, it's cold. And uh, so this model, uh, well, Einstein uh, uh, proposed the cosmological constant and then said, well, no, maybe I should not. And the, 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 the expansion of the universe came from Hubble. So it has been built step by step. In the uh, 80s, 90s, we have this establishment of uh, a model where you have uh, dark matter, maybe there is dark energy, maybe not. And then in the early year 2000, it just uh, focused into what is called the concordance model, which is we know that about 70% is cosmological constant and about 30% is matter and about 5% is baryons. And then around the year 2003, 2008, then precision cosmology came along where the name of the game was to measure the parameter of this model with exquisite precision. So somehow each one is standing on the shoulders of the giant <laughs> from the previous one, built step by step. And when this whole house is built, you want to make sure it's not a house of card. So you want to sort of, you know, check the foundation and, uh, and do uh, precision determination of the parameters of the model. Um, let me answer live. Okay. Another question, uh, Sven, how likely do you estimate the chance that the solution to the dark energy could be a flow in our physics model? Excellent question too. Mm, could be a flow on our physics model, but of what? I mean, models are always models <laughs> and theories are there to be, to be falsified. Mm, so let's say the following. Uh, let's say that we tested gravity on uh, with precision test on solar system scales. Then we've extrapolated this and uh, on galactic scales, on galactic scales, we already see that we need some dark matter. Uh, we can dis discuss uh, whether uh, you can change gravity and get less dark matter, but the consensus is that you do need dark matter. And then with that, we get to scales that are of, you know, scales where galaxies are already points, but on scales that are yet small compared to how much of the universe we have observed. And then there we see the effect of, uh, of dark energy. As so now you ask, how many order of magnitude I have extrapolated? Gravity, as Einstein tells me, gravity works. And it turns out that you've extrapolated some, you know, about uh, eight to 10 order of magnitude. And then you look around and you say, do I know of any other physical law that I've extrapolated that much and I, that they, 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 I didn't have to change? So then you start thinking, well, maybe, Dark energy is a flow in my physics model, 
But then you go back and you say, well, but I see the evidences of this dark energy from observation that are so different from each other. I see the effect on the reaction of our cluster grow. I see the effect on the reaction of to dark energy, our galaxy grow. I see the effect on their clustering. I see the, the geometric effect. I see the background effect. I see so many effects that it seems difficult to say, maybe it's not something like dark energy. So um, yes, it's still an open question. I don't have a definite answer. And that's why the community is spending billions of dollars and the career of many smart people to actually try to address this question. Okay, shall I read the next question, uh, Jorge? I have two questions. How does the standard model of particle address the problem of dark matter? And uh, I read a book by Stephen Hawking who argue that there is no point in asking what produced the Big Bang since the notion of time was created at the Big Bang. What's your opinion on this argument? Okay, all right. So uh, the standard model of particle physics actually had something that will tell you there could be dark matter. So if you are if in, in looking for uh, supersymmetry, it turns out that there could be something like a dark matter particle being produced there. So it does address this, this problem. Uh, however, it turns out that all the candidates that came out don't quite fit cosmology at the same time as observational constraints from direct dark matter detections. But this doesn't necessarily mean that it's not the same thing, because as you know, you need to give enough freedom to the theorist and maybe they will come up with something that fits uh, all observation. So that's the very cool things of this Ouroboros, uh, that uh, the strongest uh, indication for the existence of dark matter comes from the cosmos, but that's, that gives you some important insight of what is the model of particle physics should be and put you some constraint because you do need to produce if dark matter is a particle, something like that. So regarding of uh, asking was what what produce uh, uh, the Big Bang. So it depends what we mean by Big Bang. So in the uh, standard Lambda CDM standard model, there is a period of accelerated expansion that happen after the singularity. So who plays the instrument, what power the Big Bang, it's intended to be what created this period of accelerated expansion. Then the actual hot Big Bang, the hotness that explains the origin of element, et cetera, happen after this period of accelerated expansion. So uh, we are not asking what created this, this space time, although in some sense, you say it's a quantum fluctuation, and so we can discuss that. And this is, goes inside this, this accelerated expansion that, it's, uh, that is uh, uh, inflation. But uh, as you know, as you go back too much in time, at, even uh, during inflation or at the beginning of inflation, we don't have the math even to describe that because uh, it's very, very small scale. So you have to use quantum mechanics. And the entire universe was in there. So it's, it's very heavy and very energetic. You have to use general relativity and you know quantum mechanics and general relativity don't go along together. So we don't even have the tool to discuss that. But we do have the tools to ask, ask how did the, this accelerated expansion happen and what power this accelerated expansion and therefore the hot part of the Big Bang, which is what we need to explain the abundance of the element. Yes, that, that we believe we have a chance of understanding it and to constrain it based on observations, which to me is the most important thing. Vitya, you have another question. Oh, okay. Question and answer. 
Okay, and do do the last do, one. Sorry. Oh, do you have an event or discovery in mind that will change your vision of the universe in the near future? Ah, very interesting. Um, there are quite a few of these things that can actually happen, but they are sort of uh, odd, uh, odd chances out there. So what, that's what I call surprises. So we have this model, this concordance model. It seems to work well. It describes a lot of observation of the universe. Uh, it's too good to be true, and it's an effective model anyway. Can we see cracks in this model? Because if we could see cracks in this model, then that would really change my vision of the universe. Yes, of course, because you know that's the, 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 the baseline, the reference model. And then if that has cracks, then it means that there is really something we don't understand that makes it all exciting. So what would this crack, what could this crack be? These cracks could be, for example, that you measure something that you believe is the same quantity from two completely different observables, say very early universe observation and very late time observation, they don't agree. And that makes you think that maybe your model is not quite right. Or say that uh, uh, we are trying to constrain from observation of, uh, from cosmological observation, the mass of neutrinos, because we know that neutrinos have mass because they, we have, we've seen neutrino oscillation. That uh, was another Nobel Prize given by the experiment of neutrino oscillation, but we don't quite yet know what's the mass scale of the neutrinos. But there are experiments that are trying, you know, particle physics experiments that are trying to constrain the neutrino mass. Right now, cosmology is more sensitive, although more indirect, and therefore has already put some limits. But say that this experiment say, I don't know, the neutrino mass is 0.4 electron volt. And cosmology said, no, because we have already ruled out a neutrino of 0.4 electron volt. Then it's really good. You start thinking and say, oops, <laughs> maybe what we've seen is not neutrino, or maybe that's another crack in the model. So this is what I think could change my view of, uh, of the universe. So something that shows that the current model, which we know love and work so well has some cracks because that would really leave us with our head, uh, scratching our heads. Another question from Jorge, do I pronounce the name correctly? Could gravitational wave revolutionize the way we observe the universe? They did that already. <laughs> <laughs> they have already revolutionized, uh, revolutionized the way we observe the universe. They've opened basically a new window into seeing messages uh, from the cosmos. Now, so far, most of what we have seen is relatively close, but that's because of the sensitivity of the experiment. But uh, there was uh, one uh, famous event that happened in the summer of a couple of years ago uh, that had an optical counterpart. And so with that event uh, alone, uh, the collaboration was able to uh, measure one of the cosmological parameters of the standard model. And now that's a completely new window. Imagine that now that determination still have, has large error bars associated because it come only from one event. But imagine that uh, they have, say, 20 of those events. And probably they do, because they've been taking data for another two years. And imagine that the number that come out for that quantity is different from the number that come out from, say, observation of the baby universe or observation of galaxies. Then that will indicate one of the crack of the model that I was uh, telling you before about. So, Yes, it has revolutionized already the way we observe the universe. It's also telling you that, uh, you know, uh, there was at some, a some point the possibility that all these events could have been uh, primordial uh, black holes instead of uh, end of stellar evolution black holes and somewhat. And then if these are primordial black holes, then they could be the dark matter. Now, the fact that the event that have been seen could be the whole dark matter in the universe has been ruled out thanks to 
a lot of work done by a lot of people in the community. But this doesn't exclude that some of those events that we see in gravity waves without the optical counterpart could be primordial black holes and they could be part of the dark matter or that's still a possibility and it's a very actively researched one. These are all wonderful questions. Are you all students of cosmology? <laughs> you are in the wrong conference. <laughs> we want another conference, Lydia. <laughs> They're very interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to hear uh, all this. Thank you. Well, so I think that that's all. There are no more questions. So thank you, Lita, for your time. And a special thanks thank to you. all the speakers, uh, partners, and sponsors. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for attending the session. Uh, see you and uh, all the participants on Wednesday at the presentation of the challenge. And of course, we encourage you to stay at the, at the cultural dinner with Bennett. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can join the Discord server uh, in the channel of the recipe that you have chosen uh, in 10 minutes. If you have not chosen any recipe because you did not fill the forms or uh, you just can enter the, the channel that you prefer at that point. And let's get ready to cook. Good luck for the challenge, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Vanette. Thank you, Mar. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.